Today we're going to talk about a father who had a demon-possessed son, and he brought the son to, to Jesus Christ. Remember a few weeks ago we had a sermon titled the the yeah the, the thank you and uh, how how a mother prays and there's nothing like a praying mother in uh, when she's concerned about her family and and how she did the right thing she didn't run away from Jesus she ran to Jesus so I wanted to do the same thing today uh, the the love of a father uh, for his son or the love of a father for a demon possessed child but Unfortunately, that's not what God had for us this week. That's not what the scriptures are emphasizing this time. Instead, I think there's something really interesting going on here. Jesus Christ is using the circumstances that come to him, around him, and he's using those to teach some important lessons to his uh, disciples. So from uh, verse 14, Matthew chapter 17 from verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. You can hear the, his desperation, can't you? This is a dad who's concerned about his boy. Jesus, you got to help me. Nobody else could help me. Jesus, though... Remember, he kind of held up the, the woman, the, the Canaanite woman, the Syrio-Phoenician woman. He held her up as an example of faith. But instead, Jesus is going to teach on something a little different here. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long do I have to stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. We see, a, we see the same account in, in Mark, gives a few different details, and then again in Luke. So each one of the, uh, of the gospel writers wanted to focus on this story, and they each give a, a slightly different perspective, which is interesting. This is the man's only child. He loves his boy. He loves his son. And he is he's in anguish. What can he do ever since he was a little boy? He's been afflicted by this serious situation. He tried the apostles, but they, they couldn't help. So he went straight to Jesus Christ, and he found freedom for his son. He went straight to God and found the salvation he needed. And it's interesting here, God got all the glory. Did you know that we can't do anything on our own? Can't cast out demons uh, can't raise a Christian family, can't get a hold of our temper, uh, can't learn to use our finances the way, spend our money the way God wants us to. We can't learn to be patient. We can't, we can't do any of these things. Now, you can use your pride, by the way. I'm going to stop drinking because I don't like what it does to me. And you push it down, and then you think, look it, I can, I've got willpower. I can do it. What's wrong with everybody else? We can use our pride to kind of shape our character, but all we're doing is elevating ourselves. We're building ourselves. So who gets the glory in that situation? God? No. The only person who gets the glory in that situation is ourselves. Jesus Christ was able to do something here. The apostles couldn't, and God got all the glory. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the la those who labor, labor in vain. It is useless to guard a city... The watchman keeps watch, keeps awake in vain if God's not in control. Brothers and sisters, you want a Christian family? You want to build a wonderful church? We can't do that on human power. We can't. It's useless. It's vain. We can't. Mothers and fathers, be desperate in prayer for your children. Go to Jesus for your families, for your husband, for your wife. If you have trouble with somebody in church here, don't write them off. The world knows how to cut people away who bother them, who don't give them enough respect, who irritate them. If we have trouble with our brothers and sisters, take it to the Lord. Say, Lord, if there's any wicked way in me, please reveal it. And Lord, help me to win that person's heart. Father, I want to surrender to your will. 
Okay, let's look at verses 19 and 20. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive the demon out? He replied, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, remember Jesus talked about a mustard seed before? You can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus, why couldn't we do anything? Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you had even just a little bit of faith, you could move mountains. Nothing would be impossible for you. The Adam Clark commentary points out that the disciples, you know what they did? They focused on their lack of success. They focused on their lack of success they didn't even think about a failure of their faith. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was kind of my eye-opening. Why, why, don't, why don't I have a, a better situation with my family? Why, why, is, why is this situation never getting better? Why, why isn't, you know... Adam Clark goes on to write, They were confounded at their want of success, but not at their want of faith, which was the cause of their miscarriage. When the ministries of the gospel find their endeavors with respect to some places a person's ineffectual, they should come by private prayer to Christ, humble themselves before him, and beg to be informed whether some evil in themselves might not be the cause of the unfruitfulness in their labors. Okay, what did I just say? Well, you read some fancy guy's language. I didn't understand that, so I tuned out. Okay, well then, okay, thank you, Aaron. You did not tune out. Aaron was paying attention. Everybody paying attention, like Aaron? How often do we sit around and say, I, I knew a fellow once, he was a businessman. I, I led him through the sinner's prayer. And then he disappeared. I tried to contact him, tried to contact him. He had prayed, Lord, come into my life, forgive my sins, all that. He wants to follow Jesus. Couldn't contact him. I messed him for about a year. One day he shows up at church, about a year later, and he's just angry. He's angry and bitter, and you can tell he wants to fight. I said, how have you been doing? He said, not good at all. All those things he told me about Jesus are not true. I don't have any peace in my life. I don't have any joy. Nothing's working out for me. I said, where have you been? Have you been going to church anywhere? No. Have you been praying? No. Have you read your Bible? No. Well, you didn't have enough faith to do things God's way, did you? But you're going to blame him for it. We have so much trouble in our lives, and instead of wondering, wait, is this because of a lack of faith? Did I act out of the flesh? Did I act out of my own selfishness or my own, my own thoughts? Or did I? And then we blame it all on God. Mustard seed faith is not a lot of faith. Sometimes we... We think about faith like we think about the, the force, you know? You know, in Star Wars, the force, you remember Luke Skywalker, he can catch his lightsaber like that. He just got to shake, and he goes like this, like he's kind of constipated a little bit, you know? He goes like that, and he can pull up the force. In, in Star Wars, the idea is if you have enough power over the force, you can, you can basically do whatever you want. And sometimes we get this idea in Christianity, because we're not reading our Bibles, that if I just generate enough Faith. If, I, if I just get a lot of faith energy going, then I can do whatever I want. Jesus said, no, 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 it's not about you. All you need is a little bit. All you need is a little bit. Think about, think about it this way. Uh, if I was going to put 240 pounds of pastor in that chair, uh, it doesn't matter if, if I really believe this chair can hold me. If I just think, I think maybe this chair is going to hold me. What matters is I have enough faith to sit down. And then... The dependability, the object of my faith, can it hold me or not? It's like, it's like walking out on thin ice. I've got a lot of confidence this ice can hold me. You go out there and you go and you die, okay? They fish, they, you're like a popsicle and they, they have to fish you out. And... Or, or, you say, boy, I don't know if this is going to hold me or not. But the ice is four foot thick, so you're scared and you're nervous. I don't know if I have enough faith. It's going to hold you. Because what's important is not how much faith you had. It matters the object of your faith. God is rock solid. 
He'll take care of the victory. We just have to have that little bit of faith. We have to have just enough. Uh, we have to be able to step out in faith. Christ will do great things through people when we believe. What holds most Christians back? What holds us back from sharing our faith with other people? What holds us back from saying, I'm going to say no to my former way of life. I'm going to say yes to God. Because we don't have, really have faith that it's going to work out that way. I'm, I'm confident. I'm comfortable with doing things my way. I've got to do things differently. I don't think I have enough faith for that. I have to talk to people about Jesus. I don't think I have enough faith for that. I have to take care of my finances God's way. I don't think I have faith, enough faith for that. Uh, I have to control my temper. No, 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 no. You don't understand. They've got to get a little piece of me for them to shape up. Because we don't have faith. Just a little bit of faith to say, okay, God, I guess I am going to do things your way. But, you know, it takes a little bit of realism, too. I don't actually need that much faith. Because all I have to do is look at myself and think, boy, I'm so messed up. I better do things God's way and not my way. I don't see confidence when I look here. I see confidence when I look up there. Some scholars think that uh, this is a cool idea. Uh, you remember King Herod the Great? There was a lot of Herods, but this is the, the King Herod the Great when Jesus was born that time period. He actually took a hill, a small hill, and he took slave labor, and they worked on it for years, and he built up a giant hill with a kind of a flat top, and he put a fortress up there, a palace, and that was called the Herodium after uh, King Herod. That, uh, that hill is still there today, and it looks impressive. I mean, you're coming up on it, and there's farm fields all around it, and, woo, this huge mountain, and you're thinking, that's man-made? That's artificial? Some scholars think that Christ may have been in that area at that time. So everybody knew, look at what the government can do. Look at what King Herod can do. This, this monument, this glory, this grandeur, he can move a mountain. He can put a mountain. And Jesus said, boy, people who follow me, if you had just a little bit of faith, you could move that. You could cast it right into the ocean. It'd be, it'd be the end of that. Now, now, King Herod used slave labor, and he built this great monument to his wealth and his power, his glory. As far as I know, I don't remember any Christians building uh, this massive artificial hill like that. Maybe a little landscaping around the church property, but nothing like that. So what is, Jesus said you can do greater things. King Herod built this artificial mountain. How, could you, how can we do greater things? Or, or I don't remember any Christians who prayed in a, in a mountain actually got up and said, I, I'm just going to scoot you over about 10 foot. Or, or got up and said, I'm going to move a mile and a half, and people wake up and say, wait, what? when did the mountain move over there? I don't remember that ever happening. Jesus said, if you have just a little bit of faith, you can move mountains. Well, our, uh, our friends, the, the atheists and the Muslims, like to jump on this one. and They say, here's a little test to see if the words of Jesus Christ are true. He said, if you have a little bit of faith, you can move mountains, and guess what? No mountains have moved. So either the Christian God is not real, or Jesus was not speaking the truth, or Christians are totally worthless. They don't even have a little bit of faith. So which is it, A, B, or C? Or maybe Jesus wasn't talking about rearranging geography? I mean, that seems obvious to me, but apparently a lot of people read that and think that's talking about moving around big hills and mountains and things. He's talking about metaphors. Is there another option? Was Jesus telling us that no human achievement Nothing that human beings can do, no matter how grand, no matter how glorious, it doesn't matter. The Empire State Building, these great, uh, these great monuments to wealth and power, none of that doesn't impress God compared to what his people do when they walk in faith. I wonder if, if one child who's le uh, running out in the world and is messed up and and mom's praying and praying and praying, and that child comes to Jesus, and their life gets turned around, and they, they turn from all the things in the world to loving God, and God says, boy, that's worth the, more than the Empire State Building. That's worth more than all the money on Wall Street. That's worth more than all the gold in Fort Knox. When, when, when a husband and wife are just like this, and they just can't get along, and God speaks life into their marriage, and they, they learn how to forgive, <coughs> and they learn patience, and they learn mercy, 
<coughs> excuse me. And God says, boy, that's worth more than all the works of art combined. That's beautiful. God looks out and says, oh, I love that. God getting more excited about, the Bible says when one person turns to faith in Jesus Christ that there's a party, the angels celebrate in heaven because another soul has been snatched away from Satan's claw. Another soul is not going to hell. God is excited about these kinds of things. What are we excited about? Ooh, look at that shiny building. Ooh, look at that fancy car. Ooh, look at that man-made artificial mountain. That's neat. You ever think that maybe the things that excite God are not the same things that excite us? The things that God values? Just one person turning to Jesus. Just one person getting off an addiction. Just, just one couple brought together in faith. More important than all the things together that we put together. And if we have enough faith to go out of our comfort zone to say, okay, God, enough of my way, I'm going to do it your way. Everything about me, Lord. I'm not going to hold a part of me back. Everything, God, it's yours. And Lord, it doesn't make sense to my way of thinking. When, I have, when I'm thinking with my eyes, people need to pay. I need to look out for number one. I need to get what's mine. And Lord, that hasn't been working for me. It doesn't work for anybody. I'm going to I'm going to chuck it all, Lord, and I'm going to say, I'm going to do it your way. You first. You everything. Verse 22 comes next here. Verse 22. Oh, by the way, verse 21. Uh, none of the old manuscripts have verse 21. However, the same idea is found in Mark. And so it's very likely. There's either two things that happened. Either it was in Matthew originally, and then it somehow got out of it. We have no record of it. And then it jumped back in later, or some scholar who knows the story was just writing this along, and, and he thought, well, I, I know the story from Mark, so he just writes in what's supposed to be there in Mark. Uh, but the part in Mark uh, talks about prayer. The part about fasting also is a little iffy. So you look at Matthew and you look at Mark, it's very likely that Jesus was saying, you got to pray, you got to trust me. So whether that was, fasting was part of that or not, originally we don't know, but that was probably not found in, in, in uh, Matthew here. Okay, look at uh, verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, so they went back up north, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to human hands. He will be killed, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And his disciples were filled with grief. So he just came from this situation where he casts out by the power of God. Demons, a demon, Hollywood makes them so big and scary. A demon is nothing compared. Jesus says one word, and it's gone. One word, and it's God. So he casts out this demon. The disciples couldn't do it. And then, as they're walking, because he says, you guys, you've got to have faith. Just a little bit. And if you do, you can do impossible things. And as he's walking along, he says, you know, guys, I'm not going to be with you all the time. I'm going to be going pretty soon. So you better get this faith thing down. You better start learning how to walk in faith. I don't think this is by chance. Jesus is telling them, you will do great things. The apostles turned the world upside down. Now, uh, all but uh, one of them, you know, one of them committed suicide, but of the, of the rest, all of them died for their faith in Jesus Christ. So this doing great things apparently didn't mean saving their own hides, which is another thing that the world values. Maybe... God has a lesser value on that. The disciples were feared, filled with grief because they didn't get Christ's plan that he had to die, that he wanted to die in order to, to gain forgiveness for our sins. Look at, look at what comes next then. This is an interesting little passage. Sometimes you might wonder, why is that even in the Bible? If you think this is a story where we're supposed to say, ooh, we can get money out of fish, I think you're missing the point. Because Jesus is going to do something miraculous again because miracles are easy. You know, miracles are not a big deal for God. Miracles are just, they just are easy. You know, everything's easy for God. So, verse 24, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, which is on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter. So, every uh, Jewish male, I think over the age of 20, had to pay a temple tax every year. 
So they came to Peter. They're waiting for Peter and Jesus, and they ask, doesn't your temple, doesn't your, your uh, teacher pay the temple tax? Because they knew Jesus wasn't paying, right? So they, they want to see why, is not Je- why isn't Jesus paying. And Peter says, um, yes, he does. I think it's so funny here. He didn't talk to Jesus first. They come to him, doesn't your teacher pay the tax? And he just says, uh, yeah, he does. And so uh, when Peter came to the house, he goes, finds Jesus, and Jesus was the first to speak. When Peter came to the house, Jesus was the first to speak. So before Peter says, hey, I just told these guys you pay the tax, we pay the tax, right? Before he even says that, Jesus looks at him. I wonder he smiles a little bit. And he says, what do you think, Simon Peter? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? They collect it from their own children, or do they collect it from others? From others, Peter answered. Then for the children are exempt, Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense to go to the lake and throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours, which is kind of neat. So Peter, remember, he was a fisherman. Peter gets to go fishing. Isn't that fun? Jesus says, why don't you go fishing? Jesus could have said, dig in this dirt right here. They're going to find a some coins there. He could have did whatever he want, but he knows Peter likes fishing. So it's nice. God is good. And every once in a while, we get to serve him, and God says, and you can do what you really love. You love to sing? You can do that for me. You, you love children? You can do that for me. Every once in a while, God says, what you really love? Go do that for me. He loved fishing, and Jesus said, go do some fishing for me. We, and so he got to serve God and go fishing at the same time. That's a pretty good deal. Sometimes we get to do what we love best and serve God at the same time. Not always, uh, but when it happens, it's a grace, and it's something to be thankful for. Jesus didn't have to pay. He's the Son of God. He didn't have to pay. But the key here is when he says, so that we would not offend them. So that we would not offend them. You know, there's things, there are things that uh, are offensive. Get down on your knees before holy God. You're a messed up sinner. You need to confess your sins. You need to get right with the Lord. You have no hope. That offends our pride. The cross says you can't cut it. You're not good enough. If we were good enough, Jesus wouldn't have had to die for us. The cross offends our pride. Jesus Christ offends our pride. The idea that we need a savior, I, somebody needs to save me? No, I'm a self-made man. I handle it myself, thank you. Nobody needs to help me. Jesus says, if you want to be part of what I'm doing, reach up your hand, take a hold of me, and I'll save you. But there's other things, you know, we don't need to do. Brothers and sisters, are there things that are not moral issues? Pay the tax, don't pay the tax. Jesus said, I'm gonna, I'll, okay, I'll give you the money. They're not moral issues, but we, we get so rebellious and, and angry. How dare they because somebody else is offended? You know, if I had a vegetarian over to my house, a vegetable, vegetable-tarian, whatever, if I had him over to my house, I would not feed him a big juicy steak or eat one myself. You know, that would be salad day. Because I want to be gracious to this person. I want to love this person. I don't need to offend them by my freedom here. Christ was free from paying the temple tax, but he had bigger battles to fight. He was trying to save their souls from hell. He didn't want to argue about it for drachma coin. Are there things that we just, how dare they judge me? How dare? And God is saying, you don't, you don't need to, that's not worth getting upset about. Give them the four drachma coin. If that's gonna, if that's gonna help you to be able to speak Jesus into their life later. Second Samuel twenty two twenty eight says, "You save the humble, God, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low." I believe in God with all my heart. I believe in God more than I believe I'm standing here right now. I could be hallucinating. But the things of God, they resonate. They're real. 
And God says, Dan, I bring the haughty down. And I look up and I say, God, I don't want to be on your bad side. God doesn't have a bad side. but No, I don't want God to be working against me. I don't want my pride. How dare they judge me? How dare they? God says, deal with your pride, Dan. I'll deal with these people. But why are you getting so offended so easily? Why are you getting upset so easily? Give them the four drachma coin, Dan. You save the humble. So God says he saves the humble, but he brings the proud down. So do I believe in God or not? Psalm 10, 17 says, O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You hear the prayers of the humble. You will strengthen their hearts. You will incline your ear. It means he's going to listen. We want our prayers to be answered. Be humble. Humble towards God and humble with other people. We don't need to be ticked off all the time. We don't have, need to be uh, our pride injured all the time. We don't need to be upset all the time. A humble person is not easily offended. Psalm 25, 8 through 9. Good and upright is the Lord. Amen? Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way to live. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. I want to know his way. Part of being humble is being good at seeing our own sin and not fixating on other people's sins. You notice that? Uh, Pharisees are really good at seeing other people's sins. Don't see their own sins too easily. Brothers and sisters, if we spend a lot of time ticked off with other people's sins, that's a pretty good sign we're dealing with this humility issue. God, reveal to me where I fall short. Lord, I want to see because I want to serve you, and, and I, don't, I want you to lift me up, Lord. I don't want you to bring me down. A man's pride will bring him low, Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him down, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Isaiah 66, 2. Oh, this is beautiful. What do I have to do? Honor. Uh, what's that? All court here in session or something? Whatever. Anyways, pay attention because this is really cool. God says, this is the one I esteem. Wow. God of heaven who made all these universes, all these trillions of stars, saying, this is the person I really respect. God? <laughs> For reals? God, looking down from heaven, says, oh, this is the guy that I really respect. This is the guy that, uh, God says, the one I esteem is he who is humble and broken in spirit and trembles at my word. You hear these words and you don't go, yeah. But you hear these words and say, oh, let this be true of me. Oh, Lord, I want this. I want this. I want to be like you. Do we tremble at the word of God? Or do we say, yeah, right, as if, whatever? You ever notice that we talk to God like teenagers talk to their parents? We do. God says, forgive. Yeah, right. God says, be humble, Whatever. God says, I want you to live your life to, to win people to Jesus Christ. You say, ah, do I have to? I'm so busy. Reruns of Gilligan's Island are on. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus Christ reveals another side to humility. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Well, the first thing... To actually come to Jesus, you've got to put down your pride. Because nobody who's, who's self-righteous, thinking I'm right in and of themselves, they're not going to come to Jesus. I can do it on my own. I don't need it. So Jesus says, come to me if this burden of your sin, if the world is laying heavy on your shoulders, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus King of kings, mighty God, creator of everything, says, I'm humble. How far did he humble himself? Well, he let his own children, his own creation spit on him and mock him and beat him up just so that those same children could go to heaven. 
Philippians 2.8 explains this. It says, Jesus, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we have two difficult things that Christ is trying to teach his disciples. Faith, faith and humility. Lessons from ministry on Jesus. The disciples wanted to serve, and they said, we can't. Do you want to serve? Do you want to be part of God's kingdom? Do you want to be part of God's mission of love, to love this world that we bring them to Jesus Christ? Do you want to be part of something bigger than yourself, something that has eternal value that's more than a shiny building or a fancy car? God says, if you want to be a part of what I'm doing, you have to be like Jesus. We need to walk in faith. We need to walk in humility. And these things are so hard. It's so hard. The two go hand in hand. If we don't have faith, we won't trust God. We're going to reject Christ's command that we take up our cross, imitate him in his life and in his death. I don't want to do that. That's hard. So I'm going to look for the easy way out. People do that in marriage all the time, right? God, God uh, hates divorce, but I want to take the easy way out. I've got to get out of this. I've got to escape. I've got to run. People do that in a church, too. You mean I have to learn how to forgive these people? But God, they treated me with disrespect. Forgive them. Oh, no, I think I'll just head for the door. Friendships. So hard, because I'm so messed up. got to make them pay. These are hard lessons for, for me. I, my flesh likes the comfortable way, the easy way, the quick way. What would more faith look like in my life? Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you that question right now, okay? Think about your own life. If you were walking more with faith, not by your sight, but by faith. If you were walking close to Jesus, I mean closer, how would things be different? Can you think of anything that might be different if you were walking with more faith? If, if I learned to walk by faith and not by sight, I wonder if I would complain less about my life. I really think I probably would. <laughs> I can't imagine going for a walk with Jesus. He's right next to me, and all I can do is complain. If I was walking close to Jesus, walking in faith, what would my life look like? Maybe I would desire the things the world desires a little bit less. Different values, different priorities, different expectations. Would I be, would I be more ready? Ask yourself if you had more faith. Would we be more ready and eager to serve God and serve other people? And do whatever it takes to rescue people from hell. Do whatever it takes to, to let people know that Jesus loves them and there's forgiveness and there's heaven waiting for them if only they would turn from their wicked ways and turn to the Lord. If I, if I had more faith with the things God loves, you think I'd love them more? The thing that God hates, like pride, you think I hate those things more in myself? What would humility look like Please ask that for yourself, not for me right now. God's got a lot to deal with for me. So. If you were more humble, I mean even more. Even more. Because I know to become a Christian, first you had to humble yourself, right? You get on your knees and say, God, forgive me, I messed up. But I mean, if we were walking in humility daily, how, how would that look? If people would see you and say, that is a humble person. That's a humble woman. She's not easily offended. She's not easily upset. She doesn't hold on to grudges. Look at that humble man. Uh, he's always there. He's always serving. He doesn't get any of the credit and the glory. Look at that, Look at that humble person. They don't mind if they're overlooked. They, they, they're not wrapped up if, if somebody offends them. What would it look like if this idiot right here were more humble? If I were more humble, what would be different in my life? Would I feel less entitled this entitlement mentality is rampant in the church. I have a right to happiness. I have a right to these blessings. Why did they get those blessings? I should get those blessings. 
Would I feel less entitled to blessings <coughs> that I don't currently have? If I were a little more humble, and instead of looking what other people have, I just say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've given me. Thank you for this, for this fresh air today, the breath in my lungs. God, what a beautiful creation. It's like the most beautiful, that tree against the sky. Gorgeous. Lord God, you gave this to me? Thank you. Lord, you gave me brothers and sisters? Thank you. God, you know they're not always, okay, yeah, you're right, God. I'm not always either. Right? God, you gave me your heart? You, you wrote me a love letter to show me your heart, your will? God, you love me enough to discipline me? Thank you. That's a hard one. Less entitled to feeling like I deserve the blessings that other people have. Would I be more forgiving, you think, if I had more humility? Would I be more patient? I think patience usually is pride, often. Who do they think they are? How could they treat me like that? Huh, I'm going to let them know, you know. I'm a nice guy as long as you treat me right, but cross me. That's all arrogance. None of that comes from the Spirit of God. That comes from my flesh. How about demanding my rights? I have a right to all these things. Christ knew his time was getting short. He needed to teach his disciples some hard, hard lessons. They were not spiritually fruitful. A demon came against them. They couldn't do anything. They were not spiritually fruitful as they could have been because they still needed to learn faith and humility. Do you know that, that a humble church pleases God? Did you know that a humble family is a joy to God? A humble church, a humble friendship, a humble family, a humble person, they don't have all the anger and the divisiveness and the drama that a church or a family or a person walking in the flesh has. There are powers in this world that can build beautiful bridges and, and in beautiful buildings, there are powers in this world that can make a, an awesome, special effects, beautiful, awesome movie. Grand monuments to wealth and power. And there are also powers in the unseen world. They're ancient, they're cold-hearted, they're angry, they, de they despise you. They want to destroy your faith, they want to destroy your marriage, they want to destroy your life. Unseen powers that can torment our souls. And these powers cannot stand people of faith and humility who are fully surrendered to God. But guess what? They also cannot stand before people that are fully surrendered to God. People like that, that are humble and faithful, God can use a person like that. And we don't have to have the best preaching. We don't have to have the best music. We don't have to have the best building. We just have to love God enough to say, okay, God, your way first. And I'm not going to be a a burden in my church. I'm going to be a blessing. And I'm not going to waste my life frittering it away, fretting and Frittering or Ray fretting. I'm going to go spend my life to go love on people and bring them close to Jesus because there's nothing else that compares. So the disciples needed to learn these lessons. And next week we're going to see, because you know those, those uh, divisions in the chapters are artificial. Those came later. You know, Matthew didn't write the chapter marks when he went through. Jesus is going to be, he's going to keep teaching on this idea of, of broken spirit, a contrite and broken spirit. He's going to keep teaching on this idea of humility because Satan's greatest sin was that I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. I'm going to set up my throne. I'm going to decide what's right and wrong. And that's the thing we struggle with most too, having enough faith to say, okay, God, your will and not mine. So Jesus is going to keep hammering away on this. We thank you, God, for this Bible, and we're going to keep uh, preaching on this, and we're going to keep working on this because guess what? One sermon, we're going to go home. We're still going to have to deal with this faith in, in, in uh, humility. But thank God that he doesn't give up on his children, right? He's not writing us off, and we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep going, and God can use people like that to keep going. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, 
and conveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.